So today I would like to talk to you about the challenges that data archives and data repositories face with new forms of data, social media, web scrape data, these forms of data. For today's talk, I want to structure it around four questions. First, let's look a bit at what researchers are actually doing with this, these new forms of data. That is to get us all on the same page a bit about what we're talking about, but also to understand these issues from the perspective of researchers. Second, let's look at what repositories are doing. And of course, this is a very wide range. Some repositories are already holding and disseminating this, these kinds of data. Others are not. Others aren't even thinking about doing it because it's too complex or too expensive for their plans. Thirdly, there aren't a lot of great resources yet, but there are certainly some, and there are very interesting examples of work being done. And I want to point people to that because it can be hard to find things. And at last, if we have a bit of time at the end, I do want to raise a br broader question about the social policy implications of handling this kind of data and making it available for rep replication. So let's take a look at the first question. What are researchers doing with this kind of data? What kind of research are they trying to address? Well, they're actually doing very similar things that they're doing with other kinds of data. So they're interested in social science questions about consumer behavior, electoral behavior, health, health activities of individuals, um, and, and others. Really, there's almost no, nothing as online and offline worlds merge that researchers aren't investigating. The, what's different, of course, is how people are getting a hold of this data. And in some cases, they're getting a hold of it through specially designed tools. One of these is called Cosmos. It's a tool at the University of Cardiff in the, in the UK. Um, and it's a, simply an interface that allows researchers to access Twitter data directly and then do their own research. Sometimes researchers can do this on their own using APIs, application programming interfaces. Obviously, this extends the skill set that many social science researchers need to new, um, new capacities. This one is more for, often more used for Facebook. Sometimes people try to get a hold of the data ready-made, if you will. And in this case, they might try to buy it from third-party uh, providers of social media and other data. And also, they collect it themselves. They solicit responses from Twitter or go out onto Facebook and um, ask for part um, participants to, to donate, in a sense, their, their data. So the important things to know for archives are that these data are somewhat different in many ways, but in largely because they have not come through the legal, um, the usual consent procedures for normal social science data. Each one of these methods of data collection differs in sort of its um, technological requirements and in particular things like its transparency and the ease of reproducing the data. Th these are the factors that have implications for data archives in particular. Let me look at a, just a couple of examples of some really exciting and innovative research being done in, in this area. And these are examples that do have implications for challenges for, for repositories. So one is an example of looking at linking data. And this is one that's being done by Tariq al-Bagdal and other colleagues um, at Cardiff and others in the, in the UK. And they're linking Twitter um, accounts with one of the largest and most significant longitudinal surveys in the UK called Understanding Society. They're starting with their already existing Understanding Society uh, pop population, their, that sample, and asking them to first, of course, if they have Twitter accounts, and then do they give consent for sharing their Twitter accounts. So this is immensely complicated from a consent standpoint, standpoint as you can imagine, and they've developed ex very um, sophisticated procedures for, for doing that. The second example, um, Disclaimer, I'm a co-author on this work, but also another disclaimer, the bulk of the work is being done by my colleagues at GESIS, Johannes Breuer and Katarina Kinder Corlanda. This work is interesting to me in a couple of different ways. One, it's not only um, Twitter or Facebook data, which tend to be the dominant forms that most social scientists are working with. This project is looking at web scraped data, so trying to track where people go on the web, what they look at, how links they follow, that kind of, um, that kind of data. The other insight or challenge that's developed in, in this paper, which will be published shortly, is it required buying data from a third-party provider. 
And that has become quite complex with negotiating rights over the data, and in particular, rights about share onward sharing of the data, um, for example, the underlying data, data for this, this publication. So this raises one of the big challenges for archives in dealing with new forms of data. Well, I hope that gives you a flavor of the kinds of activities and uh, challenges, topics that researchers are pursuing. So now let me look at our second question. Is what are repositories doing regarding this, uh, these new forms of data? And again, it's the, a wide continuum of activities, so I'm going to um, go through two or three examples to try to give you a sense of this uh, range of activities that archives are doing. Well, probably the first point to make is archives, by nature being somewhat conservative and risk-averse organizations, are moving relatively slowly in this area. Um, and that's for some very good reasons. There are challenges um, that arise for archives that in dealing with these new forms of data. There are complex le new legal situations, the most typical one being specific uh, conditions in the terms and conditions of platforms imposed that restrict what can be done with data. Tw all of them um, have various kinds of restrictions. Twitter, in particular, restricts republishing of um, entire tweets. Of course, then we deal with ethical challenges, the second big area. Much social, data, social media data, and in particular mobility data, tracking per, uh, location data, can reveal identities, reveal personal information. This now falls under the General Data Protection Regulation and requires uh, complex legal and ethical compliance to be able to work with and certainly to share, share this data. Uh, there are, the, of course, practical and technical challenges coming back to the issues, the sort of standard descriptions of big data, things like volume and velocity and veracity. These matter for archives, but in many cases, the size of the data sets we're working with are not prohibitive yet for our technologies. Um, most challenging typically are things like velocity. When we're trying to handle streaming data, that becomes um, a greater demand on our existing infrastructures. I won't be saying too much more about that. And finally, um, these data are different from things that we're used to, and because of that, they require more complex and more detailed kinds of documentation. We don't have standard forms of metadata and documentation for these kinds of data. All this is now being explored and developed, but it takes time to produce. One example, I'll start with an example from the UK data surface, a relatively easy and straightforward one. So the UK DA has been taking various kinds of social media data for you know, several, several years now. What I'm describing here is a relatively simple data set that has come into the um, self-archiving system at the UK DA called, called ReShare. This study is um, uses tweets and it's been and it uses tweets to study the issue of food fraud in fish products. Not something I know a great deal about. However, um, it's not does not involve particularly complex data, uh, and the decision on the part of the UKDA has been to archive only tweet IDs, basically just the number that describe or links to what that t that tweet is, not underlying tweet content itself. This is to stay compliant with terms and conditions from Twitter. Um, so you can see that this, the data are not particularly exciting. It is nothing more than a list of numbers, the user uh, want, want two ID numbers. This list of numbers can be taken back to Twitter in order to rehydrate, that is reproduce the tweets and get back to the original content. But the archiving this material is relatively simple and doesn't involve um, particular legal or any, or any kind of technical um, complexity. Okay, next I want to look at a somewhat more complex, challenging case of, of social media data that have been successfully archived. This is a study um, called Geotagged, uh, sorry, Geotagged Twitter Post from the United States, a tweet collection to investigate representativeness. As the title suggests, it was a quite methodologically driven study, but the focus was on the collection of and then subsequent archiving and sharing of tweets that also had geolocation um, information, the actual geo coordinates attached with the tweets. 
So as with the previous study, the decision was to archive only tweet IDs, again, to remain compliant with Twitter's um, terms and conditions. However, this study went through additional ethical review, and the decision what rested on the risk of disclosure based on the provision of the geo information. And that risk was judged small but significant enough that this data set isn't available, um, isn't open, isn't publicly available, but is under a more restricted access category of requiring permission to get access for the, the data. But the goal from the very beginning with this geotagged uh, data set was to attempt to make it as fair as possible in our archiving language of fair. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. So it's archived in Datorium, the self-archiving system here at, at GESIS. It's findable catalog record, and it is preserved with a DOI, um, and most importantly, I think for this kind of new data, it is reproducible. The detailed documentation of how to reconstruct this data set, the Python scripts that allow that reconstruction are all um, provided along with the data itself. So in this sense, given the, the um, need to balance the ethical concerns and disclosure risks, these data have been made as open as they can be, um, partially closed as necessary to take into account the privacy risks. I've been talking about this relatively conservative and I would say in some sense slow approach that many archives are taking toward handling these new forms of, of data. Um, both of the examples are European. Um, this is probably not too surprising given the um, additional concerns about general data protection regulation and so forth. I think it's worth a few minutes on looking at, at, le at what's happening in one um, d institution based in the U.S., which is taking unofficially at least a different approach and a more liberal approach to interpreting terms and conditions being imposed by the um, social media platforms. So the example I want to talk about is from Justin Littman, who's now at Stanford, was it uh, in the library system, was at George Washington University. And what he's commenting on, this is from a blog he did for the, the Medium, is his liberal interpretation of the definition of third party in social media companies' terms and, and conditions. So I'll re read this to be clear. So at George Washington, Univers sorry, at George Washington University Libraries, we unofficially interpreted this, in the definition of third party, to allow sharing Twitter data sets that we have collected with anyone affiliated with GW, including students, faculty, and other researchers, and their collaborators. So what this means for um, researchers at George Washington was that once any party within the university collected a data set, then it could be shared with anyone else in the university. This obviously is going much further than most interpretations of archives and, uh, and other institutions in, in Europe, but I think it raises a point about um, that I'll come to later about how flexibly we might want to challenge, to consider these terms and conditions from the social media platforms. Let's move on to the third question now, a bit more practical perhaps, and that would be looking at resources available. And I want to say just a bit about research, resources uh, for researchers who are grappling with how to approach working with social media data, uh, but focus for this audience a bit more on the resources for data archive staff, repository staff, and what, um, what is available there. And the other thing I'll address in this question is some uh, activities, very practical uh, plans uh, with SESDA projects that I hope that are in the planning stage and I hope will um, go forward for next year, for 2020. To start with some a resource for, for researchers, I've spent a lot of time on this topic actually in the last couple of years as part of uh, Sarah's projects and, and others, and I would say it actually is quite quite difficult. It is difficult because of the diversity of what's going on with new forms of data. We use that as a catch-all category, but it includes a wide range of formats uh, with different problems. So what I find researchers want 
most often actually are examples of somebody who's done something a little bit similar to what they're trying to do um, that they can then review and adapt. So that's part of what um, I'm focusing on is providing these kinds of examples. So one to start with is a, a really lovely article by Heather Small and um, co her colleagues, What Your Tweets Tell Us About You. And the article is quite broad and covers other things, but they, they really do try to address the issues about um, whole, getting the, this Twitter collection, uh, Twitter collection into, into a repository at the University of California, Los Angeles Library. And another reason I like it is that they use, uh, they were grappling with the data set, I should describe first a bit, is called Hypercities, Egypt. And it was Twitter content based on the Arab Spring um, events uh, in both Egypt and Libya in 2011. Uh, so extremely difficult data. Of course, much of it, yes, did indeed have complexities with ethics, with disclosure, with political risk, and so forth. So they were able, the, the group of researchers were used a uh, resource, the guidelines provided by the Associ Association of Internet Researchers, which have been revised in 2012, and to help them work through the process of handling and holding this, this data. I think it's a good case. The guidelines are not a uh, mechanical checklist, they're more like thought questions, but this team was able to use those questions to, I think, handle this data very, um, very, very effectively. So, um, then, a second example of some of resources to talk about. Again, a disclaimer since I'm uh, co collaborated in, the, is in this project, but along with ma many other, other people. There is a new CERIS, uh, deliverable from the CERIS project um, on uh, guidelines for the use of social media for, with, uh, with survey research. And again, I would say this, this deliverable um, does suffer some of the problems of team editing and com committee work, but it does draw on the expertise of a wide range of people and attempts to cover the ground of uh, legal, copyright, ethics, uh, and some technical challenges for working with this kind of, uh, kind of data. And again, in particular with an audience of, of survey researchers, and in addition goes into providing uh, some further guidance for researchers attempting to link this data with other, um, uh, so do the linkage between survey and uh, social media data, which is increasingly common um, from what we're seeing um, researchers in, in Germany anyway. And this, on this slide, I'm going to talk about just a handful of some other resources. Again, disclaimer, uh, I have, have part, um, contributed to some, some of these, but, um, and I'll try and add some additional resources to the PowerPoint with extra, extra links. One activity is that, as many of you already know, there is currently uh, a guide, an online guide produced by SESDA on data management. The training group it hopes to be working on revising, not quite revising, but modifying and, and producing a new version of that guide that is going to be targeted for um, service provider staff in, in particular. And as a part of that, we will attempt to, to address some of the challenges of new, new media data. It will probably be at a relatively basic level, but that should be a resource that we will at least make a start on uh, for, for next year. Um, second possibility of something to look at is a second edition, I have to say I am proud of this one, of a book done with my UK co-authors um, co on managing and sharing research data. And there's a new chapter in here on handling issues with big data. And it covers some of the examples I've already talked about uh, here in this talk, but also challenges with streaming data and a variety of other, um, other formats. Um, so there, uh, there, is good, um, good there are good resources there. There's one final resource I want to point people to, but in particular for Twitter, because um, I think this work is so impressive. Again, this is done by the, the team at, at Cardiff working, working with Twitter data. They produce this nice flow chart, which is a, literally a step-by-step -step guide to researchers on the challenges of producing, um, sorry, of both publishing and sharing Twitter content. And one reason I like this and the paper, the underlying paper that goes along with it, is that they explicitly take on this question about why 
even when the data are quote unquote already public, that is already in the public domain, it may still be inappropriate to further share or publish or archive that data. And they go through a, I think, quite sophisticated ethical consideration and review about this distinction about um, something public being made public by the original tweeter versus being republished and made available for, say, for download through a data repository. So it's really a quite um, nuanced guide, and I highly recommend it. To wrap up this third question, I want to look in some detail um, at interesting plans, I hope, for what CESDA um, archives might have a chance to work on next year in 2020. This, what I've got up on the screen now, is a draft of some deliverables that are proposed for a CESDA work plan on new forms of data uh, for, for 2020. Now, as we know, there's um, still some uncertainty about activities that will be funded for CESDA in 2020. However, there's a good chance that this can get some can get funding. So uh, what I want to highlight are these activities and essentially put out a um, invitation. There are a number of partners involved in this pro project already. Um, we, uh, if we can get funding, we might um, ha be able to take more more participants. But I think everyone should know about what is um, in in the works for for planning. So we're going to be working on challenges of metadata. Um, I hope for both Twitter and uh, Facebook. That is the actual structure of metadata fields for uh, record for records with Facebook and Twitter. With Cosmos, with this group in the UK at Cardiff that I've mentioned, we're hoping to actually develop a workflow for what happens when a researcher works at one of these facilities, downloads the data, works with it, do their own research analysis, and can that tool then actually help them produce a repository or archive-ready package um, that can then be sent on to repositories like GESIS or UKDA or others uh, and make that process more streamlined and more um, wrinkle-free, if you will. Then we've got a handful of a bit more kind of research-focused outputs, things like uh, conference presentations, producing white papers, um, producing some training, training events. All these are possibilities of ways people might be able to get engaged. So already I'm quite excited to say that we've got the Czech Republic and Greece, Hungary, Slovenia, and Slovakia involved, as well as GESIS. Um, again, the possibility for more, more participation. If people have resources and interest in any of these other areas, um, please, please talk to me. Let's look at the fourth question now. Um, that takes a, a bit of a broader view on these issues, but I want to ask what's really at stake here going on with the use of these new forms of data for social science research? And within the context of that broader debate about what's going on with the, how the data are being used, what in particular are our responsibilities as data archives, as data repositories, as researchers as well, in, in this debate, in what's going on with uh, the use of this material? Why I want to raise this question is because I don't think it's any longer possible to treat the kind of research being done with social media data as um, incidental, indirect, not central to quite critical public policy debates going on in the world right now. The obvious one, of course, is Facebook data and elections, um, but it's not the only one. There are other kinds of studies. Just to pick one example, give you a bit of background, uh, Raj Chetty is a researcher at Stanford and he has gotten exclusive access to Facebook for an immensely um, detailed study of the issue of inequality in, in the U.S. So where I think this raises at least questions that we as archives have to, um, that we have to think about is we claim one of our strategic uh, missions or one of our goals is to make critical data available for reuse, for replication, for validation, and so forth. We claim we are trying to aspire to goals of fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, re reproducible. But almost none, I think it's fair to say, almost none of the debate of the data underlying these critical um, policy debates is in any way accessible to for for replication. Um, so 
do we as archives have any responsibility to have a voice in these debates? Do we simply go along with what researchers are doing and um, archive or not as they bring data to us or not? Or do we have a different kind of responsibility to um, at least make a statement that we believe these data should be uh, moved into the public domain in some way. There are initiatives in this area. Some of you may have heard of Social Science One. I can say more about that in Q&A. But I think it's um, these are worthy questions for us to think about um, and not get, bog, not get bogged down only in the technical matters of metadata and storage space, but to think about the broader social implications of what's going on with this research. So this final quote is, um, I guess, something that has really gotten under my skin, if you will. It's from, it describes Raj Chetty's work, and it's Robert Putnam commenting on that work, saying, um, that he's done, Chetty is doing unbelievably good work on this inequality study, but why? Well, mostly it's because he's been able to get access to data that nobody else was able to get access to. And this so flies in the face of what I think we um, want to stand up for and represent for data archives and for social research in general that I think it's a worthy point for um, perhaps to pick up more in the Q&A. Thank you very much for your attention today. This video is produced by the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. For more information on CESTA, please visit www.cesta.eu.